wonderful to see so many familiar and new faces here. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. This is a great excuse for us to, uh, to discuss um, America's policy towards uh, Central Asia. I've been waiting for this panel for a long time and I'm so happy that it's happening here at the Central Asia program at this conference with this specific crowd. I think there is a lot that we could learn from our guests today. Uh, I'm Nabo Boymanova. I work with Voice of America. I've been covering U.S. Central Asia policy since the early 2000s, uh, watching it closely, and I have known our guests for a long time. I have uh, talked to them both on the air and off the record, and I know that they are incredibly candid people. I've always admired their brilliance, openness, uh, energy, of course. We have Ambassador Lori Kennedy. Uh, Ambassador Pamela Spratlin and Ambassador George Cole. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, you would think that these veteran diplomats are relaxing now, but no. <laughs> they are very busy doing all sorts of interesting things. Some of them are traveling, writing, teaching, and sharing their knowledge, wisdom, and experience. Um, I have, uh, you know, the, the thing about being a journalist, of course, you know, you think you have access to everything. Here in Washington, you don't. You have to fight for it, uh, always. And um, and I've never gotten enough of these ambassadors, and now former ambassadors, I never have enough time to engage them. So it'll be hard for me to share my time with them and with you. But we will, you know, we have about two hours here, so we'll, we'll make sure that we have plenty of time uh, for, for questions. And uh, I'm, I'm more than sure that um, we'll get a lot of great questions here, and also our discussion will generate some interesting questions that we haven't even thought about before. I will briefly introduce our speakers again, just providing some bios, and then we will get to know them more as, as they speak. So Ambassador Kennedy, she's a career Foreign Service officer of nearly 40 years. Um, her history with Central Asia goes back to the late 1970s, which I'm really, really interested in hearing more. She was ambassador to Turkmenistan, and in fact, she was the first ambassador to Turkmenistan, and she served there from 2001 to 2003. Weren't you the, but the uh, third. ambassador, ambassador, right? Before you, there were basically chiefs of mission. No. Well, no, Joe Hewlings, Mike Cotter, um, oh. and my good friend, Steve Mann. So actually, no, I was fourth. Mm, okay. So, and then you became the deputy secretary of uh, state for Europe and Eurasian affairs. I only wish. Deputy Assistant Secretary. Deputy Deputy, 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 Deputy Des. And then she also taught at National War College. Then she was appointed as the uh, U.S. Permanent Representative to the Conference of Disarmament in Geneva. We remember that. And then you were also Special Representative for Biological Weapons and Convention Issues in 2010. And then after you retired, you were called back again to serve in Turkmenistan, which I think, I believe, was in 2004. Then you served the U.S. mission to the U.N., so she's, you've been, you know... I've been around. Yeah, you've been around. <laughs> uh, and and so. she's been traveling to the region lately, uh, actually doing educational tours, so we want to hear about that. Ambassador Spratlin spent this decade in Central Asia, I think it's safe to say that, uh, serving as America's top diplomat in Kyrgyzstan, and then she went to Uzbekistan after that. Uh, I, she also worked at the U.S. Embassy in Kazakhstan. I first met her when she was the Director of Central Asian Affairs at the State Department. And then you also briefly became DAS. I think DAS for And then, um, and then you went to Kyrgyzstan. <laughs> so, you recently retired, but you're still involved and around. Mm -hmm. uh, Ambassador Paul, I was just watching our interview from 2008. And you still look the same, but I don't. <laughs> it's been 11 years. I'm like, really? That, that was when you were asked to uh, yep. focus on Central Asia, and then Ambassador Paul went to Belarus. After that, he went to Uzbekistan and then to Kazakhstan. At some point, Ambassador Spratlin and Ambassador Paul basically switched uh, places. Uh, I know you're affiliated with Harvard University's Davis Center now, like you them. And you live in Rhode Island, so we really appreciate this trip all the way here. Uh, as I said, you know, this roundtable is something that I, you know, I envisioned for a long time, and this is a great, unique opportunity for us to look deeper into the realities of uh, managing these complex relationships Washington has uh, with the region. 
Uh, we want to definitely highlight the intricacies. We want to talk about things that working diplomats wouldn't be discussing. So um, I'm going to challenge our guests to be as candid as, as possible and tell us about things that they couldn't talk to us then. Um, I want to throw some central questions here, and this will be for all of you, uh, to get this uh, discussion you know, started. And then I have some specific questions too. So what were the driving factors of US policy in Central Asia when you started there as ambassadors at different times, of course? What kind of challenges and opportunities do you see now? You know, you've been out recent. And then, what kind of the, the, the U.S. strategy? How has it been evolving, or has it been evolving at all? Because many of us think, and I know a lot of people here in the room think that it's been static and it's been quite outdated. And what defines America in the region now? What is so special about American presence? What is so special about America's offering to Central Asia to, you know, we want some specific examples. And then, how should Washington regard and work, deal with the leaders uh, in the region now? So those are some of the, you know, general uh, things that we're really interested in today. Um, I would like to start with Ambassador Kennedy, uh, because again, you know, we want to get some historic perspective. I know in 1978, when some of us were just born, uh, you were, you were an official you exchange exhibit guide in Kazakhstan and Tajikistan, something that you know you told me recently. How did that happen? Um, I'm thinking this had something to do with Afghanistan too, because you were the, 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 the U.S. involvement in the region also has something to do with the fact that around that time the Soviet Union invaded um, Afghanistan. So. Okay, well thank you, and it, and and. Um, and as I say, uh, uh, I've had almost 40 years with the State Department, so if I start telling war stories, please just cut me <laughs> off. Um, especially since I am going to go back and start in 1978, when I was actually on my first overseas tour at our embassy in Moscow, um, and was uh, sort of sent TDY uh, as an exhibit guide with these exhibits. And I mention that because, one, it was my first exposure to Central Asia. Um, uh, our uh, exhibit was in what was then Selinagrad. Um, and of course, when I came back later um, and saw it, it, when it was Astana, um, mm -hmm. uh, and then of course the massive growth, I literally could not find places that I remember from my time there. But I mention that because um, it gave me an enduring appreciation for the value of public diplomacy. Um, and that's been sort of a, 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 certainly a theme in my career. Uh, and when you talked about what the U.S. has to offer, I think some of the things that public diplomacy highlights are some of the things that are enduring uh, U.S. strengths. Um, but no, it had nothing to do with Afghanistan at that point. It was before um, uh, the invasion. It was 1978. It was part of actually a series of exhibits we had going back to 1956, the first one in Moscow, which featured the famous uh, kitchen debate uh, with uh, Nixon and Khrushchev. Um, so this was a series that went on for many years, gave us an opportunity to live um, and work in areas outside that diplomatic ghetto in Moscow. So again, very, very, um, I think, extraordinary experience that I and other exhibit uh, guides had. And again, um, it gave so many former Soviet citizens their first experience actually talking to someone from the West. Um, that was the case, for example, with Selinagrad, which was not an interi uh, city. Um, uh, so anyhow, that was my first taste. Um, when independence came, uh, I was serving in Turkey, and I had the opportunity to go with an OSCE mission to visit all the, the new states. Um, um, and interesting time, because to be in Turkey, since I couldn't be in Moscow, um, where the real action was, but it was fascinating to see Turkey sort of rediscovering its old ties and its, its new uh, interest in the area. And of course, they were very interested in partnering with us, um, which was fine, uh, although I think they sort of oversold it a little bit by trying to present themselves as a conduit or an intermediary, whereas I think we had no interest. I mean, we wanted to engage directly. Now, when I think back on US policy, I see three distinct, or roughly, uh, periods. The first from independence, um, up till 9-11, um, uh, the second basically um, 
after 9-11, where Afghanistan, as you mentioned earlier, was very much a part of our thinking in Afghanistan. And I see ourselves sort of morphing into slowly a third period, um, where, you know, um, uh, clearly this president is looking for a way out of Afghanistan. Um, uh, but let me, let me go back to the first period. Um, where I think uh, we had, you know, three three largely main interests. The first um, is one that carries over very much till today, and that is basically supporting the sovereignty, uh, independence, and territorial integrity of these new states. Um, we were very interested and eager to assist them in in becoming joining and becoming anchored in a whole range of international and regional organizations. Um, energy, of course, um, Kazakhstan being a major oil power, uh, I think, again, um, we helped them develop uh, their industry um, and uh, break sort of the old Russian monopoly. It, it was never about anti-Russian, as with everything. It was just giving these new nations choices. Uh, so in energy, basically, our mantra was always enhance and diversify. Turkmenistan, of course, I don't know how many oceans of, of sweat uh, we spent trying to develop a Trans-Caspian pipeline or the, um, uh, uh, you know, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline. Uh, again, it was always about enhancing and diversifying, giving them the wherewithal to ideally use these resources for their development, but as Teresa Savonis Health knows so well, uh, petroleum is very much a mixed blessing, or some would even say, a petroleum curse because you have that cash cow and it gives you that cushion so that you do not, um, you're not forced to, to um, buy your, your, your population support more. Um, okay, third, third major category I'd say WMD and I've spent a lot of my career working in disarmament and non-proliferation so I, I always highlight this one. Again, um, you look at Kazakhstan with its nuclear arsenal, um, huge arsenal, uh, so um, uh, signing the, the um, Budapest Memorandum, which also covered, of course, the other uh, uh, legacy nuclear states, uh, transferring those uh, uh, nuclear material out to Russia, helping them dismantle their infrastructure was extremely valuable. But again, all of Central Asia had bits and pieces of this. I think about the bio program in um, Uzbekistan, which was a truly a pretty scary place, believe me. Um, in all the states, we helped set up uh, programs like export uh, um, uh, controls, border monitoring, and so on. Um, another, of course, uh, 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 interest was regional cooperation. I'd say almost that was one of the toughest. Um, uh, I don't know if Alexander Cooley's at this, at this conference, but I know in his book, he said, great games, local rules, whatever, talked about the formidable barriers that, that grew up um, and why countries oftentimes had no interest in, in uh, enhancing those, the, you know, the cooperation because there was reasons not to. So that was a tough one, but we really tried hard and things like water sharing, water pricing, uh, again, very tough. Um, um, we looked at, at our aid programs, and I was talking with, with Gavin Health about this, in a regional way, we based our aid programs in Almaty, and if you want to ask me about sort of the lessons learned, I think, frankly, that might have made sense at the beginning. We were much too slow, mm -hmm. I think, to keep that, uh, and George may um, disagree, <laughs> having been ambassador to Kazakhstan, I think to keep that um, uh, regionally based. Um, uh, and I think Uzbekistan is still in the process of setting up an independent um, aid mission. Um, anyhow, but you all may have different views, but certainly in Turkmenistan, Niazov had an allergy to anything that was not based in Turkmenistan. <laughs> so he really and his folks were not interested in talking to a specialist who may have been the world's greatest expert on, say, you know, tuberculosis management, but, you know, they came from Kazakhstan. Um, again, um, Uzbekistan, I think, is so much the story today in terms of giving us the new opportunities, um, because that was also very much part of the problem with um, uh, regional cooperation because we had that sort of central country in the middle that, that uh, uh, was not a big fan of open borders. Um, now, if I had to actually grade us, I'd say for that first period, I'd give us some pretty good grades. Mm -hmm. um, we were right in there from the beginning in terms of recognizing these countries. We stood up fully staffed embassies in every single one of the republics. Now, that may seem like, you know, not a big deal. 
we did it without any new resources from Congress. That amounted to basically a 10% cut in the State Department personnel and resources that took us many years to recover from. But I think it was important because it gave the countries the sense that we were investing in their future. Um, and I think they got pretty good attention from the State Department. Um, certainly then when we turned to the second chapter with 9-11, uh, clearly Afghanistan became the focus. It was certainly a major focus of my time in Turkmenistan. Um, again, fairly good attention from the area. Um, I'd say that there was a shift, at least I felt it in Turkmenistan, when we went into Iraq. I just felt the momentum going out of our effort in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. I still think of it as um, lost opportunities, and I know this is revisionist historian, <laughs> and what ifs aren't any good, but I do see that as a, as a change. Um, now I think we're, we're sort of, as I say, on the cusp of the way forward. I know that the U.S. Is, um, has a new policy that they want to unveil at some point. My sense is it will be um, marked very much by continuity. Uh, again, that same um, uh, focus on uh, the sovereignty, independence, territorial integrity will certainly be a thing on developing sustainability of programs there. Um, but the big change from my time is the rise of China. Um, I, think, um, I think we were a little slow in, in the early years to see the role that it would play. Um, and I think it's really going to be interesting to see how this works out. Because um, after all, we do have an administration now who talks about great power competition um, that sees China as the enemy rather than you know, um, a big stakeholder in the area. Uh, and if there's one thing that I'd say, um, certainly about the earlier years, we did not try and make these countries choose among countries. We recognized, or at least I think we tried to, that of course they had um, uh, major ties with Russia. Um, China um, uh, certainly has economically a lot. Um, uh, so uh, I hope we can keep that and not try and put them on the spot mm -hmm. uh, and make them um, choose. So I've gone on way too long, but that's, um, uh, that's some thoughts about my years in the State Department. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, but I was going to say, we just did, my last chapter was, since I left government in 2015, uh, I went back to the New York Times and then most recently with the Smithsonian last mm -hmm. month to Central Asia as a way just to sort of keep my hand in. And again, China, China, China. Um, and again, that, that earlier theme I had about soft power, aside from what you read about econo economics, um, think about this. When I was in Tashkent, I went down, I got on the subway. There's monitors in the subway station that had, were playing the Confucius Institute ad sort of for Chinese language nonstop in the subway. <laughs> when I was in Bishkek at the airport, um, free newspapers, both in Kyrgyz and in um, Chinese, which were you know, newspapers put out by China. So again, they know what soft power is, um, although I prefer to think of soft power in terms of smart power. It's public diplomacy is one of the tools that you should use. So um, uh, China, 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 but again, I think how do we um, work with these countries, with China, with all the stakeholders to try and see what are the common elements uh, in our outlooks, how can we work together, and if we can't, then how do you smartly deal with those differences? So, sorry Thank for that. You. Thank you. Postscript. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Speckler? You know, I'm thinking if you're thinking this, of this in terms of time, mm -hmm. perhaps George should speak next because sure. he also is yeah, deep in the absolutely. region and yeah, was in Kazakhstan, <laughs> been there a long time, sure. and then since I'm newer, I'll, uh, oh. I'll finish up. Pamela, Pamela, whatever. That's a, that's a diplomatic trick. That's, that's a strategy. This, this, this is a true traveling. strategic uh, view because you want the last word if that's going to be the last word in the region. No, we have Pamela, plenty my, of questions I, I bow to your, your expertise there. Yeah, I, I, I guess. You need to put them closer. Or, uh, uh, there it is. How's that? Oh, much oh, better. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Keep it close. <laughs> okay, I'll swallow. <laughs> well, what can I say after Laura Kennedy has spoken to us? And so, I mean, we all go back a long ways, and so, uh, uh, it's, you know, great to be out of the U.S. government, but how to get over the, uh, the habits of, you know, you know, minding what you say in public and things like that as well. But I can see the whole gamut uh, here. When I see Clark Adams there, Department of Defense, Steve Swerdlow, Human Rights Watch there. It's like, my God, this is, the, <laughs> this is my life back, back, uh, back to the future and the like too. Because um, 
You know, I, if we're focusing on, on Central Asia, when I first started, um, uh, when I became DAS for uh, uh, Central Asia in uh, 2008, uh, and then for those sins went to Uzbekistan, and for those sins uh, went to Kazakhstan at the end. Uh, you know, I, I would say the time that I was uh, dealing with Central Asia in, uh, in Washington and then also in, uh, in Uzbekistan, uh, particularly, and then uh, Kazakhstan, you know, the challenges that I had to face, and I think many of us did, is, is juggling the various interests that the United States government in its many forms, namely Congress, namely the administration, namely the Department of Defense, uh, various bureaus in the State Department, uh, the non-governmental organization, uh, uh, community, uh, diasporas and the like have, that all, all play into uh, American foreign policy, which makes it, when you're an ambassador or you're a, a DAS, you're trying to help in, in formulating that, it becomes a, 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 mix, a mishmash of a lot of interests, and you're wondering, well, what are really our key priority interests? And I think somebody, I look at Clark, and uh, I know uh, Pamela has worked on this too. I think every administration, and every, even in the terms, like, the, you know, most of them have had two terms, you know, since I've been there, you know, two Bushes, two Obamas. Uh, now there's Trump, but, uh, uh, and, uh, and the like. And every, even when they change uh, at midterm and there's a new Secretary of State, there's always a new strategy, and there was always a new strategy for Central Asia. Like this one, there hasn't, it hasn't given, been born yet, but I've been, even when I left, I retired at the end of 2018, there was, this was in the works. I don't think it'll be basically change much because it's like, uh, you know, it's everything thrown into the pot together. Clark, I mean, you must have seen <laughs> everything. So, you know, it's, it's an exercise. It's an exercise. Yeah, yeah, you, you, can, you can just nod or not or whatever. <laughs> but, but when you're out in the field and you're, you know, you're, uh, or you're in Washington and how do you explain this and everything, it, you know, you're, you're juggling all of these, uh, uh, these interests. Like, for instance, you know, uh, at, you know the fact we had have troops in Afghanistan, they need to be uh, supplied. And the, very, the big interest in having the transit routes uh, through uh, Central Asia uh, to supply uh, the troops and the coalition troops there is a very high priority, certainly for the Department of Defense, for the combatant commanders, as something that would be uh, vital American interest. And yet, so that meant you needed to work with the governments of Central Asia, and in my case, Uzbekistan, because they sit astride that, in order to ensure and to ensure that they can get, uh, the United States can get that access across. You know, leading to something like, you know, a phone call that President Obama had to make to Islam Karimov, who at the time, you know, was because of Andijan events and the, and the that whole history that predated me of, of the withdrawal uh, from the um, K2 base and the, the condemnation of, uh, of the uh, Karimov's uh, uh, handling of, uh, of Andijan and all the imprisonments and things like that that ensued or had even predated that. You know, you still, you had to work with this government, which was very sensitive to how it was treated and the like as well, in order to get this essential piece of the American security architecture in place. Now that, of course, um, was something that, you know, we were, it was at a presidential level. The president himself, who may not have really wanted to call, but, you know, <laughs> felt that was the only way we were going to get this was to call. And the same with, uh, uh, you know, with uh, Secretary of State uh, uh, Hillary Clinton and even before that. Uh, but uh, this, of course, runs in the face of having this relationship and wanting to maintain this with all the concerns that come from Congress, that come from the non-governmental organization community and the like about, well, the nature of these governments, what, how they're dealing with their own people and the like as well, and how do you balance this of what, how you deal with this government uh, where you need something from them, very important, but you don't want to lose that because if you, how you handle all these other issues, which are very important to American constituents, if you will, uh, you know, it puts you in this. That's the true diplomacy of how you deal with all of these uh, these elements, with an eye of how can you advance them 
incrementally at some points and everything for the kind of relationship that you want to have that can be productive for all the various interests you have. I mean, similarly in Kazakhstan, you know, there is, uh, in, you know, in addition to transit, you also have uh, oil uh, and big American companies that are, they're vital to Kazakhstan, vital to these companies, vital to U.S. commercial interests. And so how you deal with Kazakhstan in its own, in the, in the issue of how it's dealing, dealing with its own people and things like that, and how do you respond to it, you know, publicly or privately, confidentially, the type of conversations that you have, has been, it's one of the great challenges um, uh, of being, a, uh, being an ambassador, but also being a, a deputy assistant secretary. Being a deputy assistant secretary for Central Asia back here, it's often, you know, your real challenge is the U.S. government and how it functions or doesn't function. Because you have all, as I said, of all these different elements, when you had these meetings at the National Security Council, presumably chaired by the NSC on Central Asia, you know, you'd have 15 people around the table, sometimes all with a different point of view of what made what they wanted. The Department of Energy, of course, the Department of Defense. You know, the Bureau of Human Rights uh, at the State Department, which kind of was separate from the rest of the State Department in some respects. You know, but you had all of these, which, again, it was, it was very good to have all of these people around the table, but at the end of the day, what did you have? Uh, what kind of a policy can you have to pursue when you have, somebody has to make a decision and that's the matter who, who does and who can. On certain cases, the president does. But in most cases, it's a lot of, yes, we want to do this, we want to do that and the others, and then you're like kind of left with, okay, how do you, how do you try to move on the, all these various elements? So that, that is one of the great challenges of, of uh, being an, an ambassador, but when you're out in the field and you're wondering, my God, Washington, what are they thinking? You know, it's a, <laughs> That becomes like, it's the most complicated. Your biggest challenge, I found as an ambassador, is Washington, not generally the government you're in, you're dealing with, and the like. They're pretty consistent, for better or for worse. It's Washington with its many things, like saying, oh, you know, what does, can anybody really tell me what is our policy? Uh, you can nod, Clark. <laughs> Knowingly. But I think that, that is, and so when you talk about U.S. strategy, you know, strategizing about Central Asia, you know, from the very beginning, it's like, what do we really know about these places? And I'd have to say, as somebody who, you know, like Laura was sort of present at the beginning, although I started in Ukraine and Belarus and everything, is how little we know and knew about these countries and what makes them, what's the texture, all the internal issues of their society and their culture. And, you know, America comes in, okay, we have an embassy and everything, but we want to do all these things. We want to modernize, we want to build, nation build, but on what that we don't even understand. Which is why, you know, the, the type of studies that you all do here are so important, but I wish that they could filter into our policy making because they really don't. Uh, you know, there's lots of stuff written and everything too, but, you know, does it make sense to policy makers who are like focused on, you know, constituents you have, you know, down in that, dome building there or, you know, the White House or business in that as well, which is real how policies are really kind of made. And yet these countries and how, what they are, their texture, the types of, uh, of, 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 you know, domestic cultural social issues as they're emerging from, you know, the collapse of the Soviet Union, you know, you don't really have time to focus and even think about it. And the fact that we don't really have cadres of people in the State Department or in the U.S. government who really know think and, and about these countries in this region of the world. It's been one of the most sort of remote in that respect. You know, now there's a lot of old Russia uh, or China and the like. And those are all, of course, big issues we could talk about for hours, like how we dealt, how we looked at Central Asia through the prism of our relationship with Russia or China. Um, and it's always been kind of an object rather than coming out of Central Asia itself, it seemed to me. So um, uh, those, uh, those are, are, are big challenges that I have seen as an ambassador and as a, and a you know, and back in Washington, you know, how the, you know, how the U.S. looks at many areas of the world through the prism of America and our society and our, and as a diplomat, you're trying to put yourself in the shoes of the people in the country that you're in, of course, representing the United States and those interests, to be able to explain that country and how it functions to your 
people back in Washington, but also trying to explain how Washington works and it, or the United States to the people in those countries. And they said, my God, is it really that? And I, I'd always say, well, that's why in our currency we have in God we trust, because <laughs> it's like, you know, we, think, we think we are. I mean, they, somebody must love us. Because of that. In any event, I, that, that's basically what I wanted to say. So thanks. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Do you yeah. yeah. Sure. Well, it's hard to follow that, George. Um, Easy. Well, so, Nabuhar, I want to thank you, first of all, for uh, moderating this panel and thank everyone who has come today. Um, you've already heard some of the names of the illustrious people we have in the audience, and I just want to note that we also have a former Deputy Assistant Secretary for Central Asia, Evan Feigenbaum, is here from Carnegie, and uh, one of the ambassadors, former ambassador uh, of the Kyrgyz Republic to Washington, uh, Kadir Toftagulov. Uh, Gavin Help, you've already heard, uh, Clark Adams, and uh, Robin Schulman, who's here from the International Religious Freedom Office. Let's see, anybody else? President of the American University of uh, That's Central right. Asia. That's yeah. right. Andy ah. Kutch. Yeah. Andy yeah. Kutch. Yeah. Right Fantastic. Here. Absolutely oh. wonderful. Fantastic. <laughs> so, um, I guess my feeling is we could certainly have more expertise in the U.S. government, but this room actually shows that there's a lot of expertise about Central Asia that has developed uh, over the years. Oh, we didn't mention Steve Sverdlow from uh, Human Rights Watch, um, who's, who's here. <laughs> so uh, there are a lot of people who followed Central Asia very, very carefully for a long time and who are very interested in what the United States is doing there at any given time. And I think that's extremely important, and I want to make sure that everybody understands that, because I think that while George is talking about the downside of having all these voices all these spoons in the soup of U.S. foreign policy and how frustrating that can be. These are also voices of interest, people who are trying to do things on behalf of the United States that in their view are important to do. And it's our job as ambassadors, or if we're in the front offices of the bureaus, to try to moderate all this stuff along with the president's agenda, this, what the secretary is saying, put it all together and try to keep that you know, policy momentum going. I would say, just listening to what uh, my esteemed colleagues have said, is that your, your, your question was about the driving forces. And I would say what's interesting about them is that they've been the same from the very beginning. So I wouldn't necessarily say that our policy is static, but I would say there are certain elements that are important to the United States and that we are going to keep worrying about those and trying to find a way to shape a policy around those interests or values. And it's going to change a little bit with each administration, but those things are important. What have we heard about? Security, a fundamental challenge for the United States, particularly at the breakup of the former Soviet Union. Um, I think that our Secretary of State, Baker, going around you know, uh, riding around and setting up embassies everywhere, making it very clear that we were interested in a whole range of issues. And I think the breadth of this interest, starting with, remember nukes? That was a real serious concern that we had at the time about what was going to happen. Um, what kinds of independent states would these be? Uh, and then how could the United States use its resources, um, use, use its power to try to help a part of the world that was extremely important but fracturing in a way that no one could really predict exactly what would happen. And to establish what some of those basic parameters of U.S. policy would be in terms of security, in terms of wanting to build a market economy, in terms of American values, if we could find a way to you know, pursue that, culture, um, beyond <coughs> exhibit guides, but you know, trying to understand who, where these societies were, and then all of the connectivity, you know, it was, this had been one country. Now we're talking about independent states. Now they're not all looking to Moscow. They're trying to, or we hope, begin to communicate with one another. So there was a lot to do. And so while I know that um, Alexander Cooley in his book talks about these different phases, I think it's important for us to just note that we're really still in the early phases of the development of these states. They are not old countries. I mean, our own country is not that old. And these states are even newer. And so worrying about things like the sovereignty, the territorial integrity, and the independence of states is critically important. And I think it was important when these states were first established, and I think it's important now, because threats to sovereignty, threats to territorial integrity, threats to independence are happening every day. We all only have to open our newspapers and see, um, I think, what happened in 2014 in Ukraine 
was a huge wake-up call for the whole region. So there have been some, I only say that to say there's been some basic parameters of U.S. policy that have been pretty enduring, and that's been one of them, and I think it's extremely important that that continue. And I certainly hope in our new strategy that we'll remember that, that these countries are still new, and that in order for them to continue as sovereign and independent states with the many challenges that they face, they need a country like the United States. And you ask, what does the United States bring? The United States brings that fundamental concern about this basic, basic strategic issue for every one of these countries. And I think that's, um, that's extremely important. Energy, obviously that's been uh, an extremely important part of our relationship. When George was in Kazakhstan, I remember when I was at ECM in Kazakhstan, just worrying about what was happening with Chevron, what was happening with the different companies that, that were trying to operate there, pipelines, connectivity, CASA 1000, all these things. Seeing this region as a region that can contribute um, in a way that the region itself doesn't always see. And so I think that's another thing that the United States has brought is um, an ability to, to, to help um, mediate conflicts, the long-standing conflict between Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, which threatened really to be very, very serious at various points. And I do think through international organizations like the World Bank, the United States was helpful in making sure that that didn't boil over to anything more than just the sort of um, the histrionics that we sometimes heard from each side. Um, so I think that was uh, also extremely uh, important. Just the basic questions of development. It's one thing to be Kazakhstan and have the kinds of resources that that country has, but a country like Tajikistan, or even a country as isolated as Turkmenistan, the, uh, how are they going to develop as countries so that they're able to provide basic resources for their people? This is an enduring problem, particularly for, I think, the smaller countries, uh, and even for Uzbekistan, which is, I think, still searching for the right formula um, for its uh, development, and we've been very, very fortunate to have some excellent people from USAID. I'm not sure that we've always figured out the exact right configuration of our development uh, policy and posture, the right mix of resources at any given time, um, but I think the fact that the United States is there to do things that other countries aren't doing. The Chinese might be putting uh, cameras in, in the metro, <laughs> but we're actually trying to invest in the people through our <coughs> programs, better health, better education, uh, working with and uh, supporting what the UN is trying to do. These basic questions of development, I think, are still, were, and are still driving factors and um, extremely important. We've heard about the issue of regional, um, the regional cooperation and how difficult this was, particularly when the country at the very center, the most populous state, um, resist, resisted cooperation with other countries um, so for so long, and uh, this was really, I think, the breakthrough moment for Central Asia was in uh, 2016 when we had an opportunity, or when the Uzbekistan uh, had an opportunity to move in a different direction. And I think that's been really the remarkable story of the last uh, the last few years. But even before then, in terms of regional cooperation, in 2015 we started um, formally looking at this this idea of the C5 plus one. But I think there had been some conversations about this even earlier because there had been stewing and throwing about things like the Eurasian Economic Union of the Russian Federation, about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. What did these things mean for the United States and what should we do um, in, either in reaction to or on our own? And I think the C5 plus one has kind of given us a platform and, and, and format. I'm not sure that um, the resources that we have attached to it and even the attention are going to be sufficient. but as you, you interviewed uh, Ambassador Wells uh, at UNGA, and I think she was very articulate about how uh, that C5 process is, is supporting what the United States is trying to do in, in terms of helping the region find its own feet in terms of a regional identity and trying to work better together. Since it's, one, it's perfectly fine to want more U.S. direct investment in any one of these countries, but the fact is they're not trading enough with each other. And so trying to build those connections so that they can um, you know, sort of uh, teach themselves to fish is, 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 I think, extremely important. We mentioned the issue that we've had embassies in these countries from the beginning. That's extremely important for countries um, like Central Asia, where the president is not going to be thinking about this region every day. The Secretary of State is not necessarily going to be thinking about it every day, but we are. As the former ambassadors, as the current sitting ambassadors, as the deputy assistant secretaries, those are the folks who are the day-to-day -day policy people thinking about this region. And I think we've been very fortunate. 
Um, I am concerned about what's happening in the State Department in terms of a hollowing out of, of personnel resources in yeah. general over the last, but it doesn't affect only Central Asia. I think it affects us uh, much more broadly than that. Still, uh, in spite of all of that, I think that for Central Asia, we've been doing pretty well over the last couple of years. The C5 plus one was embraced by the pre previous administration, and much to everyone's surprise, it's continued. Um, so I think Secretary, Secretary Tillerson had one meeting. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he did. And then Pompeo has yes. met. And so that means there's been tremendous one continuity. One plus one meeting for Tillerson, yeah. I think. And this so, was the first time Pompeo met. Them. Right. So yeah. that's big. <laughs> that's very, very serious. We've had, um, for the first time in many, many years, in 2018, a White House visit of the Uzbek president. Um, I think the last time we had a, a, a visit like that was in 2006, right? When, uh, when um, uh, no, we had President Nazarbayev come too. Yes, he, President yeah, Nazarbayev. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and when he came, and I remember, you know, the statement that uh, Evan worked on and how hard that was to get that done. Um, given the fact that Central mm -hmm. Asia is not necessarily at the top of everyone's list, but when we're able to get senior level attention, it reverberates and it really matters not only for that particular day, but on That's into the future. So. Um, I think this, this combination of resources is extremely important to making sure that the United States keeps its focus on Central Asia. Perhaps not as much as we would all like, but certainly that continuity of attention is extremely important. And then just in terms of things that we've been able to do just in the last few years, I think what's, what's interesting and, and we'll have to watch is the divergence, because on the one hand we're um, starting with uh, Secretary Clinton's speech when she went to Chennai and started talking about connectivity. We've been trying to push this idea of more, more regional cooperation. Um, but at the same time, what, what's happening in the region is, is the countries are both trying to work better together in a more formal sense, but in some ways going off more on their own. So now we have a few of them who are members of the Eurasian Economic Union, and they're working on that uh, together. Kazakhstan is kind of in a class by itself in terms of having invested in its people and now have, being able to see the fruits of that policy. Uzbekistan playing catch up um, since Mirziyoyev began to open the country up a little bit, but it has a long, long way to go uh, in order to keep young people from feeling like they need to find their future elsewhere. And then we have lots of worries about the other states. Um, the Kyrgyz Republic, the foreign minister was here, uh, I guess it was last week, week before last? Um, um, 16th or 17th last week, and uh, Laura and I were both at the presentation. Uh, it was very interesting because the Kyrgyz now have a very technocratic, I would say, um, foreign minister, somebody who knows his brief uh, extremely well, but almost every other paragraph was about how they're members of the Eurasian Economic Union now, but they want a better relationship with the United States. And so I don't know um, exactly how they're going to be able to, um, to play this. They have serious economic problems in the, the Kyrgyz Republic, and uh, lots of challenges in terms of China and how they're going to manage the relationships. So they've got a lot going on, but one gets the feeling that the situation remains a bit fragile there. Tajiks uh, always seem to be on the verge of being called a failed state, and yet, uh, much to their credit, they are hanging in there. And, um, you know, whatever you want to say about Rahman, I mean, the country is uh, a sovereign state, still not really taking care of its people, though. I mean, really struggling to make sure that some basic things are happening there. And then Turkmenistan becomes more and more of kind of a wild card, and I really have no idea what's, what's happening in uh, Turkmenistan right now. It seems to have gone back to, I mean, I'm not saying it was ever really, it diverged from, from being very, very closed, but, um, but it's, we're just not hearing that much about what's going on in Turkmenistan now. So on the one hand, there's a feeling that Central Asia as a region is sort of coming more into the public mind with things like Smithsonian trips, mm -hmm. New York Times trips, so there are more at least well-heeled travelers mm -hmm. who are going to the region and learning about it. But the feeling that the region itself I, I, is not necessarily developing in a coherent way mm -hmm. as each of the leaders makes different choices about what the future of the country is going to be. And here, I do think Uzbekistan and some of the changes that have happened over the last few years is extremely important because now um, a kind of cooperation that simply was unthinkable a few years ago is now possible. Um, you know, I'm, there's, there's tremendous work ahead on, in every dimension, but they have made progress in human rights. Um, I think I think you would agree, Steve, that you know the Uzbekistan that we're seeing now is it has many different issues, but you're able to talk to people in a way that you were not able to talk to them when George was there. 
Um, a lot of different things have happened. Same with the issue of religious freedom. They were on the bad list for many, many years where they deserve to be. Um, and now they've made some changes. And um, not that they don't need to make more, but they have made some changes. So little by little, we are seeing changes there in almost every dimension. In the infrastructure, just the way the country looks, um, in the ability of people to travel now in a way the citizens were not able to travel before, in the way the government is thinking about the economy, that it isn't all cotton all the time anymore. Now they're trying to think about other things, some kind of manufacturing, some kind of services, horticulture and that sort of thing, with the help of, of entities like USAID, um, cooperating with neighbors in a way that we hadn't seen um, before uh, on water and on, on a whole host of things. And so, and many of these changes that we're seeing, and this is why I think we always have to keep our talking points in mind and say them no matter what, because <laughs> Mirzioya must have been behind some kind of curtain when yeah. some of the, the, the uh, talking points were made that not everybody wanted to hear, because some of the things he's and doing now. Notes. <laughs> yes, and he's beginning to do them. So, um, and, and they're his initiatives. They're not us wagging our finger. It's the government itself trying to make uh, some changes. And I think, again, the United States has played a very, very important role in that as a balancer, as a country to encourage, as a, a way to kind of focus on what, is, what should be aspirational, as a developer of standards and new ways of doing things, uh, encouraging young people. Um, I think the United States could do a lot more, but I don't want to sell short what we have done already. And um, clearly, uh, the challenge, one of the challenges we have now is there's so much going on and it's very, very hard for this administration to keep its focus. But in spite of that, we are going to have some kind of new policy. We hope it will be rolled out. And I would say, to the credit of the many people who've been working on this issue for a long time, there will be familiar elements to their, that policy, and there should be. Because many of the questions that we've been talking about are questions that have existed for a very long time. Um, the last thing I'll just say in, in terms of the rise of, um, of China, I don't really know quite what to think about that for Central Asia. I know that um, these countries are pragmatic. They understand that they've got elephants tromping around. Um, they've got Russia, the United States, they have China. The, um, we haven't even talked about the Gulf and you know the, whole, the role of Islam and all Iran. the things that are happening. Iran, Iran India. India. Um, those things are also important. And the fact that they are holding it together and keeping you know, they're focused on what they want to do, using the United States as a balancer, trying to play a role where they can. I'll use the example of Afghanistan. And both Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan have tried to play, um, I think, a, a constructive role when we have asked them to, and even in their own interest. Um, but they're doing, they've got a lot to manage, and so do we. And so I think given all of that, what's happening now is about what we could expect. So my hope is that we will maintain a kind of resource base there in terms of assistance, but we do need to grow the commercial relationships in all of these countries, knowing that the United States is far away and that our companies have lots of choices about where they can be, knowing that the economy globally is really changing. But I think that there's more that can be done in the commercial area, and I would like to, to see that happen. Um, culturally, George is right. We don't know uh, enough about these countries. We need more exchange of information. We need to keep developing the cadre of people who not only um, work there for a tour or in a kind of perfunctory way, but really enjoy the region, really get their feet, get it under their fingernails and want to be there. And um, I, I think um, I've talked to some of the desk officers and some of the people who are working. <laughs> I know my staff, wonderful, wonderful people uh, in the Foreign Service. We just need to keep feeding that pipeline so that we will have those people to work uh, in the future as these relationships continue and they grow. For the future, what am I worried about? I am worried about sovereignty, territorial integrity, and independence of these states, given everything that is, is going on right now. I think that's a question that we always need to have um, in, in the forefront. The environment, um, the, the Aral Sea, the lack of water, these changes are very, very serious for the, these countries. Youth. I asked, uh, my question to the foreign minister of the Kyrgyz Republic is, are you able to hang on to your young people? And his answer was a bit equivocal, but, you know, it's a struggle. And so this is going to be a serious problem for the future of these, these countries. I'm not sure how the United States can help, but again, to the extent that they're willing to engage us on an issue like that, um, that's something that we also should be talking about. So let me just say, for me, it was an enormous honor and privilege to serve 
uh, as the ambassador in uh, the Kyrgyz Republic and in Uzbekistan. Uh, we have done a lot, but there's a lot to do. There's a lot I didn't cover uh, and could have touched on, but I'll leave it there and just once again thank everybody for, for coming and just say how wonderful it is to see my colleagues and always <laughs> learn something new, even yeah. though we've uh, known each other for a long time. So thank you. Great. Well,